everybody. Welcome to another edition of Lab 207 webcast. My name is Mr. Kite and I'll be hanging out with you today as we continue on in our series about energy resources. Previous videos we've been talking about non-renewable energy sources. Today we flip over and we start talking about energy conservation and the future of energy which is hopefully going to be renewable energy. So today's specific topic is energy conservation. Like always, let me get you an objective and then we'll get going. So by the end of this video, you need to be able to discuss strategies for reducing energy demand. That's all we're talking about today. So let's go ahead and jump on in. First thing I want to talk about is renewable energy. And like I have said previously, the energy sources that we've talked about in the last few videos, oil, coal, petroleum, which is oil, natural gas, those are all non-renewable energy resources. Um, they will eventually go away. We cannot get them back. Renewable energy resources are energy resources that either we can't use up or if we use them wisely, they will be around. This category of renewable energy can be broken down into two types. You've got potentially renewable and then fully renewable. Potentially renewable resources are energy resources that as long as we use them sustainably, they won't go away. The best example of a potentially renewable resource is wood. You can use wood for fuel. As long as you don't cut down the trees faster than they can regrow, there will always be trees around. So that would be a potentially renewable resource. Fully renewable resources are things that no matter how much we use them, there will not be less of them. And those are things like solar energy, geothermal energy, wind power, hydroelectricity, things like that. So globally, if we're going to talk about renewable energy and kind of the world's energy portfolio, 87% of the world's energy is non-renewable. So that means that 87% of the world's energy comes from coal, oil, and natural gas. If you do some quick math there, that means that 13% of the world's energy comes from, from renewable resources of that 13%. So take that 13%. Of that 13%, 77% comes from biomass. So biomass is going to be things like trees and manure. That is going to be, like I said a second ago, potentially renewable. So 77% of the renewable energy in the world comes from biomass. The rest of it comes from hydroelectric and then solar, wind, and geothermal. And we'll talk about each of those energy sources in detail in future videos. At the moment, there are challenges, uh, and those challenges point to conservation. So regardless of what energy source you are talking about, whether we are talking about non-renewable energy sources or renewable energy sources, there are challenges inherent to each of those energy sources. So we know that the challenges that come along with non-renewables are very, very large. Um, but even with our green energies, there are some problems. So like with biomass, which is wood and other things that we would burn. You got the problem of deforestation with wind turbines. They kill birds and they kill bats. You got hydroelectricity. Those turbines kill fish. You got solar energy, which takes up a significant number of resources in order to manufacture those solar panels. So if we really get down to it, the most environmentally friendly way to power the world is to just use less energy because any energy source is going to have some impact on the environment. So the rest of this video is going to talk about ways that we can look at using less energy so that we don't have to use it, any uh, energy source at all. Words are hard this morning. Man, it's Monday. So we want to go more for less and we're going to talk about conservation versus efficiency. In a previous video way, way back, I talked about efficiency being the ability to get the same amount of work for less energy. So this would be the example of using a CFL bulb or an LED bulb. You're getting the same amount of light that you would normally get out of an incandescent bulb, but you are doing so much more efficiently using far less energy. So that would be efficiency. Conservation is just using less energy period through your daily activity. So conservation and efficiency are going to be our two strategies for using less energy. On a personal level, there's some things that can be done on the city level. There are some things that can be done on the governmental level. There are some things to be done. So some of the strategies that you can kind of stick in your back pocket for conservation. You have heard since you were little kids all of the energy saving practices. Turn lights off when you leave a room. Carpool instead of go by yourself. Ride a bike. Unplug your electronics. Turn the TV off. Take colder showers. All of those are personal ways that you can save energy and that you can play some role in the solution. The government can also put policies in place. So they could go two ways. They could put taxes on using more energy. So you can do like a tiered rating system. I'll talk about that in a second. Um, but they could also put taxes on industries that use more electricity. Or on the flip side, they could offer credits for technologies that use less electricity. So the government can kind of influence what the consumer does. And the consumer has a role to play in this as well. Um, 
through our consumer choices, we can control how much energy we use. The less stuff we buy, the less stu energy we use. The more stuff we buy, the more energy we use. And also within those products we buy, we can make choices. So we can choose to use like an LED bulb versus a typical incandescent bulb. That would be a consumer choice that impacts energy usage. Um, I mentioned a second ago a tiered rating system. Some power companies have got a system set up where there is one rate if you use a low amount of energy, and then if you start using like a medium amount of energy, the electricity gets more expensive, and if you use a high amount of electricity, then you are at the most expensive level. So it influences the customer to use less energy because then their power will be cheaper. There's also the Energy Star program, which is a program that the government set up to provide ratings for appliances that use less energy or they use energy more efficiently. So one consumer choice that we can make is to purchase Energy Star rated appliances since those are going to be the most efficient appliances available. All of this can be done or should be done as an effort to reduce peak demand. Peak demand is the most amount of power that a community will ever demand from the power company. Power companies, their job is to get power to the people. So what they've got to do is they always need to be able to estimate peak demand and they always need to be ready for peak demand, which means that they need to have the maximum amount of power plants ready and usually up and running all the time so that they don't get suddenly just hit with a big spike in power that they can't meet. When power companies can't meet power demands, that's when you get a blackout or a brownout. But because power companies have to stay at this high level of readiness, it means they need a lot of power plants. So through energy conservation, if we can reduce the peak demand or the maximum amount of energy that's going to be needed, then power companies will need to have fewer power plants at the ready, which means that less energy obviously is going to be used. One way energy companies are working to reduce peak demand is by setting up different price structures with their electricity. So, you know, peak demand on a summer day is probably going to be the middle of the afternoon when everybody's air conditions air conditioners are running and then obviously in the evenings there's going to be less demand for energy. So what a power company might do is they could set up a pricing structure such that electricity is more expensive in the afternoon when everybody needs it when the demand is higher and less expensive in the evening when it's not in demand. So by the afternoon electricity being more expensive maybe people will shift their usage to even out electricity usage throughout the day. They might say all right my uh, air conditioning is running right now in the afternoon because it's super hot. So maybe I'm going to hold off doing laundry or taking that shower until in the evening when the power prices are cheaper and it's not going to cost me so much. So that would be one strategy that uh, electric companies can use for reducing the demand that is placed on their power, power plants. And then another thing we're going to look at, and this is going to be kind of the rest of the video, is talking about sustainable design. Obviously most of us live somewhere, all of us live somewhere. And that is kind of where we spend our day-to-day -day lives. And so if we look at those structures, um, building those structures more intelligently is a really good way to reduce impact on the environment and the need for electricity. So a couple of just basic design principles that we can talk about when it comes to reducing electricity usage. I'm just going to highlight a couple of them up here on our diagram. So a very easy one is going to be putting in skylights. If you have got natural light coming in from the outside, you don't need to use light bulbs. You need high efficiency windows. These are windows that let light in and they act as insulators. So rather than letting a lot of your air conditioning coolness out or heat in from the outside, these act as insulators so that you use less electricity. Adequate ceiling and insulation is a big deal because then you are not losing heat or cold to the outside. You use shade trees to shade the house so it doesn't get as hot. You use high efficiency heating and cooling systems, so this would be like a geothermal or a heat pump system that uses far less energy than a traditional air conditioner or heater. Insulating walls and floors of basements and crawl spaces. Energy Star efficient appliances, you could use recycled shingles. All of these are ways that building a house can down the road save electricity just by the way it was built rather than being built in traditional methods. You use the sustainable methods and you save less energy, which is great for you as a consumer because you use less money. Also good for the environment because less energy is being used. One specific type of sustainable design that you need to be aware of is passive solar. Passive solar is basically using design principles within a building that exploit the sun and characteristics of the sun to benefit the building as a whole. So some qualities of passive solar that you need to know about. First thing is it exploits the fact that in the summer the sun is higher in the sky 
and in the winter the sun is lower in the sky. So some of the things that you do is a passive solar house is going to have big overhangs on it. The reason it's going to have big overhangs on it is during the summer the sun is really high in the sky so those overhangs prevent the sun from hitting the walls of the house, heating them up. It also prevents the sunlight from coming into the windows, heating up the inside of the house. Passive solar houses also may have a lightly colored roof, like white, because then the solar radiation hits it and is reflected rather than being um, absorbed. Also, solar, solar <laughs> passive houses are going to utilize window shades to block out any sunlight that is coming in. Obviously, that's going to keep heat out. Also, you got your double-paned windows that I talked about, which are going to conserve energy and conserve heat. During the winter, we're going to have a bunch of really big windows because in the winter, the sun rides lower in the sky. Because it rides lower in the sky, it can shine into the windows, providing heat to the house. So you have to use less furnace electricity or gas to heat up your house because you have got the sun coming in, warming up the house. Um, another thing that you're going to use to help this out is heat absorbing floors and walls. So there's going to be like a concrete floor or a stone floor or something like that that can spend the day absorbing this energy from the sun. It's going to warm up and then in the evening once the sun goes down, this floor is going to radiate heat out into the house so that you don't have to use as much heat power because you have absorbed all that heat throughout the day and now it is going to heat up the house. And that is known as thermal inertia, which is the ability of a material to heat up slowly and then cool down slowly. So this is going to have high thermal inertia because it'll spend the day heating up and then it'll take it all night to cool down. This thing is also known as a thermal mass. Two things to finish up with. While we're talking about design principles to reduce consumption, there's the idea of green roofs, which literally is making a roof green. It is covering the roof of a structure with plants and gardens and things like that. And there are several benefits that you get from doing a green roof. One is insulation. Buildings that have got green roofs have got significantly more insulation on their roofs because you've got all that dirt and vegetation over the top. More insulation means less power for heating and cooling. They capture stormwater, which means that as the rain falls, rather than just running off that roof down into the storm drains, the plants on the roof store that water and filter it and then can release it more slowly into sewage systems. Also, plants, they increase air quality. So green building or green roofs is something that is um, being used more frequently, especially in Europe. I think it's kind of a cool way to do a building and I don't know, it looks nice. It does some good stuff for the environment. So remember green roofs. Building materials can be recycled. Um, obviously recycling is best because you're not making new stuff, you're just reusing what is already around. I think one of the coolest ways to build a building using recycled materials is through the use of shipping containers. If you look at the house over there, you can see those two boxes. Those are the shipping containers that you would see carried on like a train car or on a boat. Um, those shipping containers can only be used for so long for shipping, but once they are no good for shipping, they're still excellent structurally sound um, materials in them. So you can take those containers and you can use them like Legos to stack them together in order to put a house together. So that's, I think, one really cool example of using recycled materials for building. And I want to wrap up with LEED design and LEED certification. Um, the LEED program is a program that has come on, I think, in the last 10 or 15 years. It's basically a program by the U.S. Green Building Council that helps buildings to be as environmentally sustainable as possible. And companies that are building a building can say, I want to go for a LEED certified silver or gold or platinum building. And the higher up the level you go, the more sustainable your building is. You get green credits for certain building practices. And I'm pretty sure that those credits uh, translate to tax credits and benefits and some financial incentive. But we talked about the government putting in place programs that can increase sustainability and efficiency. LEED certification is probably one of the biggest ones because that goes to the way that buildings are being built. And it's a big thing for a company to be able to say, hey, building we just built is a LEED Platinum certified building. So that's it. Some ideas on reducing energy usage. Um, the rest of the series is going to look at specific types of renewable energy. I hope you found this helpful. My name is Mr. Kite. This has been the Lab 207 webcast. Hopefully we'll see you again.